Bill, thank you very much for, uh, first of all, inviting me to stand here and also for your, as usual, very nice introduction. I'm glad I didn't have to be afraid of what you were going to say. Um, so when this was announced, my presentation uh, on Facebook uh, through the OI, someone uh, forwarded it, shared it, and said, wow, one of the 20 people in the world who know hieroglyphic gluing is going to talk about it. <laughs> so what I hope that after tonight, uh, you at least, well, there are more than 20 people in the room, so that also makes me quite happy, that more than 20 people after tonight know a little bit about hieroglyphic gluing. I'm going to talk about script. I'm going to show you how it works a bit. I'm going, and, and hope, I hope that you will leave... Uh, with a bit of knowledge about the sign forms so that you actually will be able to go to our galleries because this picture I took in our galleries. We have an Anatolian section over there with hieroglyphic Lewian. So um, cuneiform writing on clay was uh, wildly popular, as you all know, uh, among the governing elites uh, of the ancient Near East. And although some societies, such as Egypt, only used cuneiform for their international correspondence, the Anatolians uh, additionally adopted cuneiform for domestic use to write Hittite, uh, Luwian, Hattic, Palaic, Hurrian, and I'm not even talking about Akkadian and Sumerian where we expect it, uh, and at least one other unidentified uh, language is probably in the European. But they also developed their own hieroglyphic scripts for inscriptions in Luwian only. So today I will address the following questions, three questions. Where did it come from? I'm not actually going to say that I'm, I'm not really going to answer it. I'm going to suggest solutions. I'm not going to solve the problem. Uh, where did it come from? How widely was it used? And who were the readers? Who was the audience? By the way, where is... Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, but first, I will give a short overview of the basic facts, the discernment of the hieroglyphs, and the way the script works. So, basic facts, what, when, and where. Um, you may have heard about Hittite hieroglyphs. That is actually the misnomer that has been in use for many, many decades. But nowadays, we either talk about Luwian hieroglyphs or Anatolian hieroglyphs. It is written, well, as the name Anatolian hieroglyphs also says, in Anatolia and in northern Syria. In about, I counted about 95 different locations, but there are many more inscriptions than that. Um, it is attested between roughly, although people may disagree on this, but I'm giving you a very rough number, between 1400 and 700 BCE, so for 700 years. And the language behind Luwian hieroglyphs is not surprisingly Luwian, but we didn't know that for a long time, exactly how, uh, what was written in this script and how it was related to the other in the European languages, because Luwian is a sister language of Hittite, uh, and it forms together with other sister languages, Lycian of the first millennium, Lydian of the first millennium, BC, by the way, uh, Palaic, the second millennium, Carian of the first millennium, it forms the extinct Anatolian subgroup of Indo-European languages. So it is, an in, it, it is an Anatolian language related to Hittite and a few first millennium languages. So where do we find it in the empire period? Um, this is a map taken from the very nice site Hittite Monuments. If you go there and you click, click on the individual uh, place names, you will get to those monuments. You will get a great overview of Luwian inscriptions. So in red we have the empire period, and what you see roughly is that you can find these inscriptions throughout Anatolia. Uh, the core land, which is here, Let's call this the core land. This is where the Hittite, old Hittite kingdom started. And you find it in the periphery in the west. And you find it here. You can see the red, I hope, and a few inscriptions here in northern Syria, not surprisingly because northern Syria was firmly in the hands of the Hittites at one point. Uh, after Shukli Luma the first say in the middle of late 14th century. 
Um, when Hittite died out, Luwian survived. When Hittite cuneiform stopped, or cuneiform stopped being written in Anatolia, you see a shift. So Luwian survives. In the first millennium, the shift of the, well, the, the gra center of gravity is much further to the south, to Syria. So all these black place names host inscriptions. By the way, the circled ones uh, are inscriptions I will show. I will show those. Um, Hittite was written in cuneiform on clay tablets. Where do we find Luwian? We find Luwian. What are the text carriers for Luwian? Seals, stem seals and ceilings. We find, uh, there we find Hittite or cuneiform at least as well. Where we don't find Hittite inscriptions is on living rock. We have a lot of rock reliefs and inscriptions. We also have statues, uh, steles, orthostats. So those are vertical slabs of stone, for example, uh, lining a pathway, lining a stairway of important buildings. And these inscriptions, well, seals, stem seals contain names and sometimes titles. But these inscriptions are typically commemorative, funerary. They are funerary documents or they describe accomplishments by life. We have a few, we are very fortunate to have a few uh, lead strips, only in the first millennium, letters and economic text, distribution of goods, <coughs> documentation of economic activity. Very little, we have a few of those lead strips left. Uh, this you don't, as I said, find, you don't find it in the second millennium, but these, by the way, are attested throughout the second and the first millennium. And then wooden writing boards. I will, if people have questions about this, maybe later, I won't go much into that, but there's a whole discussion going on on how much it was used, wood, in Hittite society, and what, was, what script was used. There. Well, we do know that wooden writing boards were used in the first millennium uh, in a Luwian setting. So let's get to some examples. This is one of the rock reliefs, Fraktin. Um, it is from King Hattusha III and his wife Pudukhepa. Um, what we see here is very typical for these inscriptions. Is you have imagery, the king libating in front of a altar in front of a god, and here is the name of the king. This is his name glyph, name glyph, Hattushili, uh, a sign for great king, great king Hattushili. Here is his wife, Pudu Gepa. Now, from here I cannot see it, but believe me, it does say Pudu Gepa. Uh, so we have Pudu Gepa, her name glyph, an altar, and then Gepat that I can't see. Um, why don't I put that? Use my glasses, actually. Another inscription, um, this time from about a century later. This is a first millennium inscription, and in, as you saw, this earlier inscription from the second millennium had a relief in names. In these later first millennium inscriptions, you will find much more text. So squeezed in here between the uh, images of the person and the god is this storm god, this storm god, uh, or great of Mr. Warpalawa. This means this is the great Targhunzas of Warpalawa. Um, if we go to Karkamish, these are uh, so we just saw some in images of uh, inscriptions of living rock. These are the orthostats are talked about. Usually these are the slabs that contain a lot of text. So this is, for example, from Carchemish in uh, an inscription in high relief, so which means the, uh, so the stuff surrounding the signs is being cut out. This is later from Cilicia, South Turkey, this is incised in the stone, but both are long hieroglyphic Luwian texts. I mentioned lead strips. This is what they look like when they were rolled up, probably tiny, tiny, and this is what it looks like when they are uh, rolled out. And you can see uh, two registers and the signs on these texts, and I should also say that for the other ones, how do we read? We start like this and you move around this way. So besides that, 
you also, within a register, you read from top to bottom. It's not perfect. Sometimes they are not straightly aligned, so some, that makes actually these texts not always very good to read because you sometimes don't know where the sign goes with the next word or the preceding one. Um, I mentioned wooden writing boards. Now, this is from the famous Uluburun shipwreck. Um, that this is Turkey. Here's the shipwreck. And here is a wonderful uh, example of a second millennium writing board. I'm not saying that this is Luwian, it's just an image of a wooden writing board. And by the way, there are some signs here. There is an inscription here, and no one knows what script it is. So. Um, that we do know that they use Luwian, at least writing boards were known to people in Luwian settings is look at these inscriptions. This is from Maharaj, that's also a site where we have texts and images with inscriptions. Here you see someone standing with a little wooden writing board. And his name is Mr. Tarhu uh, Pia. That's over here. Can, can, you see, can you see how it is kind of not neatly lined up? It's just a little bit of a mess actually. Uh, here's another example from the Luwian uh, Semitic area, Sam al Zenjerli, where we also have an image of a writing board. So we know wooden writing boards were in use. They didn't survive, but they must have been there. Okay, let's go quickly through. You don't have to read all this. I just want to point out how the decipherment went. Uh, what is the time for in line? So in the 19th century, people traveled through Syria and Turkey and started to see all these inscriptions, sometimes built in a building, a block, you know, moved from its original context, showing up in a building. With all these images, no one could read it, of course. And only in the 30s, you see a couple of scholars from here, Gelb, from the Oriental Institute, Emil Forer, Bossert, Rosny, uh, the Czech scholar, by the way, who also deciphered Hittite, and an Italian Merigi established the readings of quite a few signs. Uh, our own Professor Gutebock also worked on hieroglyphic, hieroglyphic Louis and he published seals and sealings in the 40s. The major breakthrough, despite all this work, a lot of signs were not read correctly. A major breakthrough came with the Karatepe, the texts that I showed you earlier. Over here. This is Luwian, but in fact it is a bilingual inscription in Phoenician and Luwian, 75 lines of Phoenician, and people of course could read Phoenician. And as a result, um, Luwian was all but completely deciphered. Um, not completely, there were some signs in, uh, that had were read in a wrong way, but in, the sev in 73, David Hawkins, famous name for Anatolian studies, um, corrected the readings of a few signs. And as a result of that, uh, hieroglyphic Luwian actually became very close to the type of Luwian that I hadn't mentioned yet, written in cuneiform. So hieroglyphic Luwian suddenly became a dialect of the Luwian that was already known from cuneiform texts. There are some minor differences. So here are some images of Gallup at work. Um, I'm going to post the slides on my academia page, so if people are interested in the literature, I have also included references to the literature on my slides. Uh, Professor Gutebock here with the two books that he published on seals, uh, royal seals. And then David Hawkins, no, he's not destroying the monuments. He's not drawing on it. He has a paper in between. <laughs> He was copying the signs, so uh, I mean, he's not smiling because of that. that he, but um, um, here is his, uh, he published uh, all, at the time, inscriptions known from the first millennium. So this is a major corpus of hieroglyphic Luwian inscriptions of the Iron Age. Um, so how does it work? This is also one of the first attempts to try to read Luwian hieroglyphs. Here's one of those seals I mentioned. Those seals, uh, royal seals, very often, or most of the time, have a cuneiform ring giving you the name of the person and the country where he is from. And in the middle, 
you have hieroglyphic Luwians, Luwians saying the same. Um, Says who traveled through Anatolia was one of, the one of the first to try to read this. And he had a little bit too enthusiastic because in the end he was not right. Uh, we have little difficulty in reading the cuneiform leg uh, legend. This runs Tariq Timis, Sarmat. So red, by the way, is what he read correctly. <laughs> and the rest incorrectly. And as a result, of course, of the incorrect... It's, he's not to blame. This is actually quite difficult to read. So because of these incorrect readings, Luwian was not deciphered. So instead of Tariq Timis, uh, king of the country of Erme, what we have to read is this, Tarkashanawa, king of the land of Mera. That's quite different from what we just saw. And now we can also, uh, we can now map what we see in the ring here, what we have in the center. And how does this work, these seals? Here, you have a sign that is used as a logogram. In this case, it's donkey, and we now know that we have to read it as tarkasna. We know that this sign is read as wa, so his name is tarkasnawa, tarkasnawa. This is the sign for king. It's a logogram, so that's not a syllable. It's simple, simply, as you know from cuneiform, a symbol that denotes a concept. King... And here we have me, and this little line says ra, uh, ra. This means a, and this sign refers to country. So we have a logogram, 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 I'm sorry, logogram, and then some phonetic signs, syllables. Um, a few very often, uh, a few logograms that occur very often. So this is typically how an inscription starts. I am ego, referring to you know, me. I am such and such. King probably refers to a crown, I always think, of countries such of such, or cities such of such. This is the symbol for city. Uh, a few other signs that you can easily find in the galleries on the inscriptions is this. This is the sign for God. Now, they, all, they talk a lot about God, so at least this sign you will be able to understand once you go into the calories. So part of the script consists of logograms, depicting concepts. But fortunately, we also have a lot of syllable signs, and they will look like this. Uh, T comes from Tia, to walk. Uh, I gave these signs so that if you go back to the slides, you can actually decipher some of the inscriptions that I've posted here. So we have logograms and syllables. Um, let me look a little bit into sometimes how, how do you read, and that's actually not very easy. So um, the point is I cannot really see it very well. Um, I think this, yes, za. Wow, you move this way, then you go to the god sign. Maybe you recognize that. This is the symbol of the storm god, which we translate with tonitrus, a logogram. We go to hu, a syllable. U, I think, yeah, za, sa, and then squeezed in. So you do this, then this, that, and then crooked. And you go down here, and you read this and then that and then suddenly you have to jump here, here first and then go there. So you can understand why the discernment actually was not always easy even with a bilingual. So how do these forms get their values? They use the acrophonic principle. So it started out as a pictogram. An image, for example, this is the giving hand. Now, we know now that the Luwian word for give is pia. So according to the acrophonic principle, you basically take the first sound or syllable, so that became p. You may have it also as a logogram, to give, and we then translate dare or something, but as a syllable, it became p. We already saw donkey, the donkey head, that can stand for donkey or tarkasna, but with the acrophonic principle, it becomes ta. 
why this is good, I don't know, but we know it means good. That's wasu. And this came then to stand for wa. And uwa, or actually wawa, ox or bull, the ox head then came to stand for u. So this is how you can derive syllable values from concepts, concept pictures. Now, I gave you Louis in words here, but a brilliant actually uh, uh, analysis of Ilya Yakubovich, a former uh, graduate student from us, who graduated from here, I don't know when, 2007 or so, or maybe even before that. Um, he found actually that several of those signs cannot be based on Luwian. They are based on Hittite. That is actually of major importance. That not all sign forms got their values from Luwian. Even though texts were written in Luwian, the sign forms got its, their values sometimes from Hittite. So this we know it has the value da or ta, but the word for take in Luwian is la or la la and not da. It's da in Hittite. The word for for is miwa or mewa, but in Luwian it is mawa. This value has the value me. Um, to walk to step, this foot has the value t, but stand or step is ta in Luwian and tia in Hittite. So again, a Hittite value for this uh, sign. And then this, it means down, and it has the value ka in Luwian, we know that, but Hittite only has kata for down whereas Luwian has zanta, a very different word. So again, we see that this syllable could only have gotten its value from Hittite. Um, before we take this up, I do want to point out that even nowadays we sometimes still have improved readings. Uh, this is a little bit of an aside, but it's, if, you can go, if you can go to the galleries, or either today or maybe another day, at one point, some ta signs, we, we thought were ta, have, they have to be read as la and uh, la too, which is another form of la. Um, and what happened when that was reread, and this is one of the tel Tainat inscriptions we have here, suddenly we have the country of Palestina, which is in fact Palestine. Now, that was not known until, say, 2010 or so. Uh, so if you go to the gallery and you look into the Tel Tainat inscriptions, try to look for this section. Uh, here is where you have, in Louis, in the, uh, the, the, the country of Palestine, Palestina or Palestina. We don't know exactly how to pronounce it in Louis. Also from here. So... Major question is, of course, where does it come from? Who invented it? Uh, based on what language was the script? I already gave you the answer, actually. It was based on um, Hittite and Luwian. And where was it spoken? And who could read it? So for a long time, we thought this. It was spoken, uh, I won't give you the German. It was spoken by the Luwians for the Luwian language in Luwian lands. Seems pretty straightforward for Louis and hieroglyphs, right? Uh, but then there was a counterproposal in 2008, and that was Ilya's reanalysis of how science, actually not, not even a reanalysis, he found out how some of the values got, you know, were derived from Hittite. <coughs> so what does he say in the end in this article that describes his finding? No, speakers of Louis and Hittite for Anatolian names originally, in Hattusha, and the Luwian lands, by the way, are not, um, I, I have to go back actually now to a map. Is it coming up? Well, I will go forward a little bit. So, Luwian was spoken here, a large area of Anatolia, and the Luwian lands are considered to be here and here, and these are considered Hittite lands. So, to give you an idea of what we talk about when we say Luwian land. So Ilya says, no, not Luwian lands. No, not just Luwian. No, it was invented by uh, Hittite speakers and Luwian speakers. 
for Anatolian names in the area of the capital, in the capital itself, and was only a fully-fledged system around 1400. And then a couple of years later, there was a counter-proposal, very recent, by Willemijn Waal. Um, she says, on the other hand, no, not 1400, but even the late third millennium or early <coughs> second millennium. And it was a pictographic scripture record, economic transactions, not names, and it was written on wood. It's a very different picture, actually. So what's going on? What can we do with that? And I, okay, I'm not going to solve this. That's what I said. I'm not going to promise, but I'm going to suggest a few things. So we have an, this Louis and Louis and Louis and, no, Louis and Hittite, Corland, rather late, compared to very early, for Anatolians, I should have said only, and uh, written on wood. So this is my summary. Louis Lens, Hattusha, Central Anatolia. Now, the analysis of Ilya showed already this, right? That the script got its values from Hittite and Louisian. Um, in order to uh, make this happen, clearly you need a bilingual area. If we look at the map of early second millennium Anatolia, we see this distribution. And by the way, um, this is my view on what's going on. Um, where I differ from a lot of people is that, yes, Luwik, everyone agrees on Luwian basically spoken here and here and here. Hittite in this area around Kultepe, Kanish. It's the hub of the Assyrian colony trade network. Here are the Hattians. And I say that Luwian is spoken here too. But the, the point is the only bilingual Luwian Hittite area is here. If the script, I mean the script arose in a bilingual area, so that can be here in the Assyrian colony period, or a little bit later when now Hittite and Luwian are spoken together in a larger area. So that would coincide, this picture would coincide with what Ilya says. The previous picture coincides with what uh, Willemijn Waal says. So the question is, did this phonetization of the script, assigning values to the uh, syllab syllabic values to the sign forms, did that occur around Kultepe Kanish? Or later within what later became the old Hittite kingdom around Hattusha? So I think we have to look at the stages of the development of the script. Sorry. Um, we have seals. I don't know if the seal specialists are around. They may have uh, to say much more than I have about this. Um, what we do know is that several of the symbols on the seals, this is a stag, stag, hair, remember, uh, uh, stag again, do show up also in the hieroglyphic Luwian uh, inscriptions when it is a fully fledged system. So, but what we cannot say that at this stage in the old Assyrian period, where Willemijn Baal places the development of the script, we cannot say it's a full, fully developed script because we simply only, we only have symbols like this and we don't even know whether it has a special value. Um, there are some artifacts from Kultepe where you have sequences of signs here so it's still the old Assyrian period. And here, and this really looks like a Luwian sign, and this might be a pot that we don't have the way we see it here. So the point is we cannot actually read it. We can, we can imagine that this is a Luwian sign, but we are not sure. And if we don't get more evidence, we simply cannot claim that this is writing. It is some, it probably conveys a certain message maybe even ownership, but you may not claim that at this point that it is writing, that they would be able to write Luwian, for example, in this. Um, now, when we make a jump away from the Assyrian colony period and we go to the old Hittite kingdom, where we have our first Hittite kings uh, attested in Hittite historical sources, for example, we have Hattusha I, the old Hittite king who ruled in this period, 1650, 1620 perhaps. And here we have an old Hittite seal with a hieroglyphic 
symbol that is also used for the kings called Hattusili later. So this is without a doubt the way they would write it in later times. And this dagger represents the sound Li. So even if we have no other evidence, we do know that at this early time, this dagger already got its value. That doesn't make it a full writing system, but we, whatever we, we don't know that. We don't have texts with hieroglyphic Luwian, but we have this sign, and we know that the phonetization was underway. Now, this seems to be quite unique. So what, other, what do we otherwise find? We still don't find a lot of writing. We have Luwian hieroglyphs on seals with some symbols that occur later. We think we know that it means, well, we, we know what it means. This probably means life. This means well-being. And this is heavily under debate, and one of the experts is in the room, so I'm not going to talk about it. People claim very often that this means scribe, if that's true, there are an awful lot of scribes and hardly any other officials, I have to say. Um, so these are seals of officials, and this is a typical royal seal. Cuneiform and no hieroglyphs. The next stage is suddenly around after 1400. This is exactly also where Ilya places the development of, of the script. We suddenly see fully fledged uh, names written out in hieroglyphic Luwian. This on the right is the sign for great king. We have seen king before. This is the name glyph with two of uh, a king, Tutgalia. But his wife's name is written with syllables. Sa, ta, tu, gapa, sa, tandu, gepa. That means these values. This is already syllabic writing. This is already a developed script. Of course, a name doesn't say what language it is, but it is a developed script. And the final stage is when we do have inscriptions, long inscriptions, in Luwian. Um, this usually is attributed in the literature to Shupliluma II, the final king. I believe it is Shupliluma I. So I think uh, this is our first major long inscription in Luwian, around 1340. And it makes sense that it is possible, because if this exists, this can exist. So maybe we cannot say where it was invented, but we can think of how it evolved. So it started probably with pictographic symbols um, in the old Assyrian colony period, or before, uh, perhaps before that. Beca stayed pictographic for a while on seals, and slowly it starts developing into symbols that have a phonetic value, like a syllable. And um, I think I'm going to agree with Ilya that it did happen in the core land around Hattusha, because that is the, bilingual, the other bilingual area that we have. We have the early bilingual area, but there is no evidence that writing, hieroglyphic writing developed there in, into a full script, but we do have evidence that it happened here. Now, of course, if we find a nice inscription from 2000, we have to change our views, but this is the evidence we have. Um, so the language of the inscriptions, when you talk about names, of course, names are just names. They could be Hurrian, by the way, the name Satan Dugheba is a Hurrian name. But the inscriptions, all the inscriptions, second millennium and first millennium in black are all in Luwian. So here we really have to agree, of course, with uh, the earlier views. Now, I was thinking about how would a local read this? This is the card. So, so if you're not belonging to the elite, and you don't know cuneiform, but you know the principles of how this works, if you can identify a sign, say donkey, and you know that the script works this way, take the first sound, ta, even if you are reasonably smart and you know this principle, you might actually at least figure out a few signs. Now, 
how would a local read it? I am afraid that locals would have to kneel because this is in the gate. And I always wondered, why would you put it as low as possible? And interesting, this is the Karatep inscription. If you remember, the Karatep inscription is bilingual, Phoenician and Lui. Now, the Phoenician is on a nice pluck, right? Right there, eye level. The Luians have to crawl <laughs> to read it. I don't know what it means. We also have slabs that are f standing upright. But the interesting st thing for this inscription is why put it at the bottom? I, I don't know. I, just, I give this to you as a weird observation. So how would a local read it? What, how would it work? So if you know it works this way, take a sign, take the first sounds. Then you, and we, oh, this is give. Ah, that is P-I. Ah, P. Now, we don't know what this means, by the way. We cannot recognize it, so I had a question mark here. Here, oh, head of a donkey, Tarkasna, Ta. So a Luwian would be able to say, oh, P, ya, Ta, and that means he gave. So this is how I imagine uh, a, a Luwian who knows a little bit of how it works would be able to decipher at least a few words of these inscriptions. Now, an interesting question is, for, what, how was it influenced? Uh, I cannot answer that. I just want to show you what people have said about influence on the development of Luwian hieroglyphs. Uh, Aegean scripts, Cretan hieroglyphs, linear A, linear B, or should we look at Egypt? I just put them side to side. Egyptian hieroglyphs, monumental, who knows? Maybe Luwian started to write you know, on rock relief, on slabs, influenced by Egypt, monumental script, I don't know that. Uh, or compare it with the uh, Aegean scripts. I do hope this is linear A and I do hope this is linear B. I plucked it from internet. <laughs> well, I don't know any of this. But, uh, and this, these are Anatolian hieroglyphs on lead. So were they the ones who triggered the further development of this script? Who knows? I'm just giving this to you. So to conclude, who invented it, this script? Uh, based on what language? And where? Well, th that was the question asked by Gutebock, and he said, Luwian, Luwian, Luwian. What I think is, with Ilya, the phonetization of the script is based on Luwian and Hittite. In other words, they are the Indo-European Anatolians, not the Ghatians, no one else. Luwian speakers and Hittite, bilingual speaker together. The first evidence of the phonetization oh, is the old Hittite period. This was the Shatushili seal. But the pictographs are much older. The phonetization took place in central Anatolia, perhaps around Ghatusha. And the language of the larger inscriptions is Luwian. And who could read it? I believe these inscriptions in the landscape you know, were visible to travelers and worshippers, not just the elites and the class of the scribes. Thank you.